Just, okay. <laughs> All right, so we are back in open session. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I uh, apologize for the lack of seating. This is about three times as many people as we have ever had show up for one of these things. So uh, sorry, ne well, next time we'll take into that into account. But uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we just have one quick thing to go through here, which is, is, is there any public comment that's not related to any of the uh, awards for the students? Um, if not, then um, we will move right into the superintendent's report. All right, and I have the pleasure of beginning to introduce all of the exciting stuff going on out here tonight. So I'm going to start by introducing Mr. Gatz and Ms. Sherman, who are going to talk to us briefly about a special club going on at Central School. I know everybody came here tonight just to hear about what's going on at Central School. So thank you all for coming. And um, you know, we had the opportunity, as we discussed at the beginning of the year, to add a club at Central, and uh, Kelly Sherman, second grade teacher, is definitely a volunteer who started the Run Club, and she brought some students here today to join the club, talk a little bit about it, and share some things that they learned this year. Thank you, Mr. Gatz. Um, as you said, my name is Kelly Sherman, and I'm the second grade teacher at Central. I'm actually a Central and Hauser alum as well, um, so this community is near and dear to my heart. And I grew up being very involved within the community and different organizations throughout junior high and high school. So I wanted to make something at Central that kind of brought that community feel to um, Central as well. And I love spending extra time with all the students and all the different grade levels because we start in second grade and we go all the way up to fifth grade. And as of right now, I have 102 students officially signed up, which is about one fourth of the school. I brought some Run Club members here with me. So if you guys could say your name and what grade you're in, and then whatever you prepared. Go ahead and talk right into there. That's right. Hi. My name is Ellie Dickerson, <coughs> and I am in second grade. I joined Run Club because I thought it would be fun and because my sister's teacher was doing it. I enjoy Run Club because I like running with my friends and also it's really fun to it's a really fun thing to do and it's one of my favorite things. My name is Sophie Dickerson and I joined Run Club because my teacher is running it. My mom and my mom did um, track when she was little. And I like the outdoors, and I like running with my friends. Nice. My name is Gwyneth Picknelly, and I'm in second grade. And I really like running club because it's a good experiment after school to like start running because, like, when you do something else, it gets all like your worries out of your. Um, mind like homework and stuff so you're not like stressed <laughs> and um and you get to run with your friends and yes hi my name is sloan and i'm in second grade i i like run club because you get after school, since you're sitting down and you're, and then like you don't, you're like all like tired, and then after that, like you like snap, and then you wake up since you're running, and then you just have a lots of fun with with your friends with running, and it's basically like kind of talking with your friends while you're running. So yeah, that's why I like running. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gavin Cohane. Um, I am in third grade. I joined running club because um, I really like running with my friends. And right after when you're really after school, when you're really tired because of learning, um, you just get up and just go run off that big block. And um, it also gets me like more like power for my hockey practice after. So yeah. My name is Liam Cohen. I'm in fifth grade, and I enjoy running club because it helps me with other year-round sports, and I like running with my friends a lot. My name's Molly Wonderlook. I'm in third grade. I like running club because it helps me practice for the pacer, and 
It's just a fun thing to do after school instead of play video games all day and hang out with your friends. My name's Cecilia Mooney and I like running club because I, um, I like running with my friends. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And I'm impressed 102. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, a, that's yes. pretty crazy. <laughs> but it's fun. It's worth it. We'll host our own 5K next year, Michigan. Hey, I'm, I'm planning it. Don't worry. <laughs> Wonderful presentations from the students, so thank you so thank much. Thank you. And we have another group of students here. Um, we decided at the beginning of this year that we would do three times a year, we would acknowledge different student awards and achievements going on in District 96. And this is our largest group, but we've actually had a steady increase over the course of the year. So this is really exciting to see everybody here. And I'm gonna quickly turn it over to Meryl Brownlow, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, and Mr. Gatz also, Principal at Central, who are going to Call students by name, talk right. about, name the award that they are getting, and we are all going to stand, and stand in the front and congratulate So students. what I'm going to do is I'm going to announce the name of the award that we're going to present <coughs> so that you know it's your group and you can prepare yourself to walk up here. If you're here and you did not RSVP after I call the names of the people that said they were going to be here, I will ask if anyone else is present from that group who is getting the same award, and you can come up and get your award as well. Okay? Everyone's got it? We're gonna start with our qualifiers for the National History B and U.S. Geography Olympiad. So our first award is gonna to go to Cole Pleppel, who was a qualifier for the National History B Finals, National Finals, and the U.S. Geography Olympiad. So Cole, come on up. the National History B Finals and the U.S. Geography Olympiad was Donovan Connolly. <laughs> and then a qualifier for the National History B Finals was Ben Mooney. <laughs> and then Ben Bursch also qualified, but I don't believe he's here tonight. We're gonna move on to Book Bowl Championships. So, in sixth grade, Patrick Hart was part of the Book Bowl Championship team. Patrick, if you're here. And joining him on that team would be Kathleen Henley. And then Isla Conkey, if she's here. Okay, girls, you can come and get your certificates and shake hands. If I butcher your name and pronunciation, please forgive me in advance and come correct me at another time so that I can get it right because I am not a pro. Okay, next up, we had some of our fifth graders participate in what was called the Noetic Math Competition, which was a national competition we actually finished in the top 20% of all schools across the country over, um, yep. And so these students were um, honorable mention recipients. Emerson Blair. Lucy Drenth. Bennett Janunas. Reese Phelan. Strong, Isabel She, Kira Miller, Maxwell Strong, and there were four others. So if Thomas, Robert, Declan, or Lily are here, please come forward also. Hey. All right, Mr. Getz, we're on to the next one. Next up is a very exciting category of awards. It is our Special Olympians. And we had four students this year compete in the Special Olympics and place. So with us tonight is Ava McCormick. <laughs> Ava, 
placed first in the 100 meter run and second in the 200 meter run and qualified for state. And then I don't think it's Luke Perry here or Cameron Dominic or is Peter Garcia here. Oh, there's Cameron. All right, Cameron, come on up. Cameron got sixth place in the 100 meter run, so that's very exciting. Okay. The next category are some visual arts awards. And the following students earned um, contest winners for visual arts. Ella, I know I'm gonna butcher this one. Schneider? Shuck Schneider, thank you. Hi Ella, go over here. Catalina Barsati. Allie Barsati. Aliyah Brabeck. And I'm not sure if Penelope Black or Michael Callis are here, but they also were part of that group. And Ella and Aliyah are moving on to state. Okay, next up, we have our <laughs> AAUW poster contest winners, women's history. The first one is Diana Arroyo. We have Alexandra Salis. And then there were two additional winners, Patrick Galloway and Katie McAllister. Not sure if you're here. Now, one of our events that's near, to, near and dear to my heart since I helped facilitate this one, the Young Author Awards. And I see um, our sponsors here as well. So we're gonna go through the list. Here we go. It's a big list. First place in kindergarten, Evelyn May. First place in fifth grade, James Long. Third place, <laughs> third place in fifth grade is Natalie Colts. First place in fourth grade, Kyle Enix. Third place in kindergarten, Allison Sievert. In second grade, Second place, Gabrielle Dorlet. Another second place in second grade, Diego Garza. A third, hi Diego, go see Mr. Gatz. Third place in second grade is TJ Goodman. Place in third grade, Lyndon Leander. Third place in third grade, Naomi Nyanweis. Nyanweis. Thank you, Naomi. I love when you're not shy. In fourth grade, third place, Jacob Rice. And in second place and first grade, Josie Chase. If you are here for young authors and I didn't call your name, please come forward. <coughs> that just means I didn't have your RSVP. Anyone else from young authors? Yeah, okay. Moving on to the West Suburban Consortium for Academic Excellence Art Awards. Another big group. So these students had their artwork selected to be displayed at Cheney Mansion in Oak Park, Illinois, along with all the other schools in our region, right? It was super exciting and super fun to see all their artwork. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to go this year, I encourage you to go next year, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so here we go. In kindergarten, Charles Parslow. 
in first grade, Sonia Peterson. Go ahead, Sonia. In fifth grade, John Marquez. Okay, and these I don't have grade levels for, but we're gonna go through the names. Emerson Blair from Central. Or Hollywood, excuse me, Hollywood. Claire Cameron from Central. Claire Evans from Central. Sophia Miller from Hollywood. Naomi Nyanweiss. Nyan Heiss? I'm getting it. Just give me three more times. I'll get it. Kylie Rising from Hollywood. And Elias Schreier from Central. And then keep we're gonna keep going. There's more. We're getting to the if you're if you're an elementary student with an art show award and you didn't have your name called, it's because you didn't RSVP. So if you're here, come forward now because then I'm gonna have the Hauser Art Awards next. Anybody else? Okay, <coughs> moving on, Hauser Art Awards. You ready? <laughs> Montserrat Regatta, sixth grade. Anna Neva, seventh grade. <laughs> Sophie Swissionis, seventh grade. <laughs> Natalie Vega, seventh grade. <laughs> Caroline Bittorf, eighth grade. <laughs> Donovan Connolly, eighth grade. Elena Eisenhart, eighth grade. <laughs> Chloe Marhul, eighth grade. <laughs> Alicia Valencia, eighth grade. <laughs> are there any other Hauser art students that are here tonight whose names I did not call? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> And this is Sarah, Sarah Waffelt. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Sarah? No. All right, Sarah, Sarah congratulations. congratulations. Okay, the next award is a very unique one. It actually is from something that was completed last year, but the award was given this year. And it is something that some of our social studies students during sixth grade, who are now seventh graders, partnered with Riverside Brookfield High School on to do a little um, documentary and it was submitted to a film festival and it won first place in the TV show category by Midwest Media Educators Association. So this, the students that were a part of that are being recognized this evening and that would be Luciano Curio. <laughs> Thomas Dixon. Very calm version. Owen Figurehut. <laughs> Apollo Gama. <laughs> Ava Hast. <laughs> Ellie Avardi. <laughs> Christian Perez. And Natalie Vega. Okay. Now we are moving on to some music department awards. So first, with the 2018 Bruce Perryman Scholarship in Vocal Music is Veronica Hunt. Congratulations, Veronica. The 2018 Choral Directors Award goes to Brooke Craig. The Orchestra Directors Award goes to Noah Brionis. 
And then we had one other orchestra director, Anthony Perry, but I don't believe he's here tonight. So we're moving on to our very last set of awards here, which would be the Choral Director Awards. 2018 Choral Director Award, Violetta Morovic. It should be in this very last pile. This is the very last pile. Okay. Band Director Award, Ronald Macchia. And Nicholas. Sucharski. Oh, probably in the back here. Yeah. Well, here, here. Shake your hands first. They're right here. I'm here. Yeah. Right there. Here they are. All right, Nicholas, we got it. That's Ron. Oh. Okay. Ron. Ronnie, there, there we go. We're good. And those are all of our award winners tonight. Our students are award winners we have a lot going on but tonight it was nice to recognize all of those in the third trimester so thank you for coming you. if you have homework to do or you want to just enjoy the 80 degree weather you're not mandated to stay for the rest of the meeting but you're welcome to a lot of interesting stuff <laughs> Thank you. You did well. I'll, I'll send all those to school tomorrow. You're the best. Thank you. Without prep, I did the best I could. It's a great. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, I'm have a good night, everybody. Congratulations. Great job again. Mrs. Miller, I think they're trying to get through behind you here. I know some of us. I just heard some of them. But no, I didn't know it before. Like one of my, my daughters, my friend's daughters, and I was like, what a good skill. <laughs> hey, you, you skipped all of us, didn't you? Yeah, you did. I want to shake too. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. You don't want to stay with us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. Yes, totally understand. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you everyone again. Um, it was fun. Um, <laughs> Should I continue on the Super Tennis Board? Yes, why don't you continue on the Super Tennis Board here? All right. Um, that was great. Thank you all for some good board representation uh, tonight. Yeah. It's all in your children. Um, all right, so the much less exciting items here. Um, I have our the updated Board of Education meeting schedule for the next school year. Um, it's continued to keep the first Wednesdays for Pretty the Whole and the third Wednesdays for regular board meetings. There's only one that jumped out to Margie and I, and that's the November 21 is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I think you probably wouldn't want to meet that night. That sounds good, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We would, No one's going to be here, right? I mean, should we try to, <laughs> yeah. should we try to just not have yeah. one, or do we should try to reschedule it? Not have it, right? Not so, can we the whole? No, regular board. Oh, regular. Um, we might have to have one. Might have to have or something. Can we switch? Can we switch? Can we switch it? That sounds good, yeah. Like, make, try to make the November a special meeting if there's action items that need to be addressed? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Or the, I don't know whether it's better to do November or December, but one of the two. Right. We figure that out, I guess. No, the 19th is much better. Maybe in just yeah. um, well, well, we're supposed to. Well, we would take that first. Um, so, so the board is uh, the board is back in session, so... Um, uh, so we could, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> um, so I, I think um, uh, people are probably in agreement that the Wednesday before Thanksgiving is not a good night, I would assume. Is that yeah. Fair yeah, yeah. So uh, why don't we just um, change it as, as Joel is suggesting to either the committee the whole before or the committee the whole after. I don't know what 
there's always some action items. I'm not sure which is right. better to do it before. I or think after, it's easier to yeah, yeah before figure it out. Figure it out as we, as we get as we move as forward. Right. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and if need be, we would consider either cow wet the November or the December, especially sure. many if there are action items that would need to be addressed. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, then the next item I had was our annual <coughs> safety meeting. I just wanted to share that we had. Um, I, I'll say second annual. I don't know if it was something that was happening before, but it was really a nice meeting on April 11th to convene our local fire and police from Riverside, North Riverside, and Brookfield. Um, we meet with our principals and our leadership team, as well as the leadership from fire and police in those three villages. Um, talk about student safety, how we <coughs> manage a crisis. Um, it's just it's a really nice kind of opportunity to have dialogue and uh, put names and faces together also. So I um, shared the information about that. Wanted to share that with all of you. Um, and other, another item that doesn't require any board action but wanted to make mention as we are planning, um, we are planning to do our annual report again um, to be sent out this summer, summer of 2018. I think that'll be the third annual report in three years. And actually our own Jason Smith is going to do the annual report this year. So okay. um, we've hired an outside consultant in years past. Um, I think it'll be really nice to have Jason do it. He um, does some work with our communications and I think also has a really nice sort of eye for layout and that kind of thing too. So Excellent. excited about that. Um, wanted to um, also just acknowledge um, our letter that we got from um, Illinois State Board of Education about our um, LEA determination, which is really a way of looking at all of our special education programming, and um, they they establish a number of criteria um, that uh, determine that we are indeed providing a free and appropriate public education for all of our children with special needs, and doing it in the least restrictive environment or the most inclusive environment um, environments possible based on student needs. So, just uh, congratulations to Pam Shaw and the special education team who continues to. Uh, keep that process moving forward in a really meaningful, appropriate, and successful way for our students. So thank you. And um, then one other item, and Linda, feel free to jump in and help me with this, is that, you know, as agreed, we want to make sure that the board and the community are fully informed as our processes move forward about uh, facilities. And they're really two, two things moving simultaneously. One is the Ames Visioning Committee. So that's a committee, as you all know, that's looking very specifically at um, AIMS and what uh, future learning would look like at AIMS school. Um, that group met and the agenda is shared there. They're actually meeting again next Wednesday and actually taking a field trip this Friday to go see a uh, more kind of updated, modernized school in Schiller Park. Um, and then we also have our facilities advisory committee continuing to meet. Um, as we know, the AIMS Visioning Committee is really charged with looking very specifically at AIMS and the needs there and the goals and direction there. Facilities Advisory continues to look at kind of the broad picture of the entire Long Range Facilities Plant, and that group met, was that just last last week? So Thursday. Yeah. Yes, Thursday. Yep. So, um, yeah, so the AIMS Visioning Committee, uh, it was another great session. Um, the teachers remained incredibly engaged. We, I don't know if you remember, the first time we met, uh, our architect Carrie was like we're not talking about space so we were just talking well this time we were talking about space so it started with um, there was some homework where we had to look for images that for different types of spaces in the school so those were all compiled and we kind of spent a good I would say 45 minutes 60 minutes looking through all the images talking about them why people put them there um, so we started with that, and then we moved on to talking about different spaces in the school. So we did a lot of brainstorming around spaces. We're doing a um, field trip on Friday morning, and then we're going to meet again Wednesday. So I feel like it's really starting to move into the more specific, which is great. I thought it was a really productive meeting. And then the, then the very next morning, we met for the Facilities Advisory Committee, and we kind of just talked about um, wanting to make sure that other things are still on our radar as we move forward with this Ames project. So it was a shorter meeting, but we talked about um, uh, outdoor space, front offices, so making sure that we, that conversation is still moving forward while we're talking about Ames. So it was a productive facilities week. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out or ask now. Or Otherwise, that's everything I have on the student agenda. Great. Thanks, Martha. Linda? Um, yep. The next item is the uh, consent agenda. Um, would the um, board secretary like to read the consent agenda, please? Yes. Tonight's consent agenda includes minutes of the previous meetings, uh, the closed session on April 18th, the regular <coughs> business meeting on April 18th, and the second closed session on April 18th. 
the minutes of the closed session on May 2nd and the minutes of the regular business meeting of May 2nd. The personnel report, which includes the average increase in administrative salaries for 2018 and 19, the 2018 to 2019 staff appointments, the payables pre-lists from April 30th and May 16th of this year, the PAV YMCA child care program for the 2018 to 2019 school year, the and the designation of the 2018 to 2019 holidays for the full year employees. Mr. Joel, um, are there any items that any uh, board member would like pulled off of the consent agenda for further discussion? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So, so moved. moved. Oh. Second. <laughs> uh, Margie, please call the roll. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. Thanks, Margie. Uh, just note that all of the administrator contracts are um, a public view. Um, the aggregate raise for across the across the uh, administrators um, that we just approved um, is 3.15%. That's the salary raise. Uh, there are no other changes to the contracts. Um, next item is a personnel item. Uh, at this point, is there a motion for the Board of Education to accept the recommendation of the administration to terminate the employment of the educational support staff member as presented? So moved. Second. Um, Margie, please call the roll. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marple? Aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. Thanks, Margie. Um, next up, we have, um, is there a... Um, a motion for the Board of Education to approve the 2018-2019 contract for the Director of Finance and Operations uh, with a salary of $135,000 <coughs> as presented. So moved. Second. Um, Martha, did you want to say a few words about this? Um? I do want to say a few words, and he actually happens to be here. So Mr. <coughs> Jim Fitton is uh, here in the audience, and uh, if he wants to come and say hi, but I'll make sure that uh, you have figured out who the, all our Board of Education members are. But uh, Jim comes to us from uh, Special Education Cooperative and also some local school districts and um, went through our rigorous interview process and really found him to be an outstanding and strong candidate and brings to us a lot of experience in the areas of uh, school district finance. So look forward to having him join our team here. Thanks, Martha. Any other comments or questions? If not, then uh, Marjorie, please call the roll. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. Thanks, Margie. Um, next up, we have the Riverside Educational Council. Are there any comments from uh, the Riverside Educational Com Council? No. If, if there are none, <laughs> uh, we move. Thank you for a wonderful teacher Jeff? appreciation. Oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> nice. Jeff, you need to item I. I skip something? Yes, you oh. did. Oh, jeez. <laughs> the most important thing. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. right. so, uh, the uh, <laughs> board single employee. Just a little, just a minor important <laughs> All right, so um, at this point, is there a motion for the Board of Education to approve the resolution regarding the superintendent schools and the contract for 2018 to uh, June, July 2018 to June 2021 with a salary of $188,000 as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Oh, I don't have a second. <laughs> Sorry. So um, we are, it's hard to believe, but we are in the second year of uh, our superintendent, uh, Dr. Ryan Toy's uh, contract. It's a three year contract. And so we are very happy that uh, she is going to stay for a, another uh, three year contract. Um, that's what we're voting on tonight. Um, so the contract is essentially uh, identical, or not identical, but with the goals have been updated uh, to reflect the goals that have been sort of. Uh, finished so far and, and they've been updated to the new goals, but the contract is otherwise um, unchanged other than the $188,000 salary for the first year. So is there any further comment on this uh, contract update? Uh, if not, then uh, Margie, please call the roll. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. Thanks, Margie, and thanks, Joel, for catching that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then we uh, move on to board member comments. Um, 
any board member comments about anything they've people have seen or uh, two things I attended the school law conference Great. three weeks ago now a lot of interesting commentary especially with regards to the very the fact that every um, IEP every student hearing is very unique and often comes with a lot of non-school uh, contributing factors. Um, I had some comments regarding the, ev the evidence-based funding, which it's important for the state, but it also tends to shoehorn everybody into the same mold. And finally, uh, attended the choir concert a week ago, which was also well attended. and. I'm really impressed with the new choir teacher. Seems to really trying to motivate the kids and bring them together and trying to rec hard to recruit new members. Uh, yeah, I uh, two things. We had the staff recognition and retirement dinner that was uh, that a few of us went to, and it was fantastic. It's one of my favorite nights to go to, and I mean honored some really great people and it was really great to see the, the turnout and the the presentations are always very moving I cried a few times you know <laughs> um, so that was wonderful and I also got to attend and I Joel, Joel was there as well I'm sure and I think Dan at the Hauser open house yes yes well, yeah. no, you don't have a house no and that was a for me a really fun night because I have a sixth and eighth grader and one who was excited to show us and one who was like why do I have to come <laughs> um, so it was really fun actually so uh, the, I thought it was Every room we went into, there was something left out to see and talk about, and the teachers were really engaging. So I, I really um, thought we'd stop in for 10 minutes, and we were there for an hour, so it was great. <laughs> I agree with Linda that the, uh, the, the teacher's uh, appreciation here was very nice, very well done. Yeah, so good, mm -hmm. good event. Yeah, no, the, the teacher appreciation was nice, and I, I did enjoy it. It was my first one. So, um, And also, I, I did go to uh, Hollywood has uh, their second, uh, I think it's their second, <laughs> I hope it's their second. Um, uh, talent show they have a talent oh, show fun. every year <laughs> and that uh, was quite entertaining had all pretty much every kid from kindergarten all the way through um, fifth grade doing something so it's awesome yeah uh, let's see I believe I attended the choir concert as well uh, very good uh, performance I'm very impressed with the choir, new choir instructor as well uh, as well as the uh, symphonic and wind ensemble band concert uh, recently held I think it was what last week or two weeks ago but um, so we're actually still missing a Lego piece from uh, from a, uh, uh, <laughs> a cars uh, piece. If anyone sees it in the auditorium, I'm still looking for that. So. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, definitely very uh, very good and very impressive performance by the kids. Uh, any anything else? All right, then uh, if not, um, we move on to the committee reports. Uh, both both Sherry and Rich are not here tonight. Um, um, Rich had a, just a couple things that he asked me to mention. One is that um, he uh, has great confidence in, in um, Mr. Fitton's abilities. Um, he inter was on the interview committee. Um, just wanted to welcome him. Um, the, other th the other thing he wanted to say, and Linda already commented that on this, is what the uh, Ames Visioning Committee was, in his view, going, going very well so far. So um, those are the two things he wanted me to mention. Um, Dan, did you have any? Um, updates on the policy committee? Well, I think it's uh, the very next item in the old business. Uh, we definitely had a lot of discussion uh, taking into account uh, the comments from the board and last time around for the uh, policy 730 for student assignment. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, that's been our primary focus the last couple uh, weeks since the last meeting. Great. All right, well then, uh, if there's no further um, committee reports, that we move on to the old business. First item, as Dan just mentioned, is the policy 730, the student assignment and inter-district transfer. Um, this is an action item, so at this moment, uh, this point is there a motion for the Board of Education to approve policy 730, a student assignment and inter-district transfer as presented? Second. So maybe we should, um, before voting on that, we should maybe, uh, Dan, did you want to just review uh, with, the, with the board and the public uh, the major items in this policy um, that, you know, anything, anything that we sort of exchanged since last time or, um, 
Well, as I mentioned, we took into account some of the changes uh, suggested from the board last time around. Uh, I think the important things to note are uh, we also, I think, included an FAQ, which uh, uh, we had not put out this, the last time. We didn't have that available yet, so we have that uh, to answer a lot of the questions uh, that those on the board or those in the public might have as well. Uh, definitely the important things to keep in mind there is that um, you know, the, the, I think the biggest change in this policy is that we're no longer uh, basing it on when a, a, a student registers, but uh, essentially much more, uh, it, it's, it's, we're trying to take into account uh, the capacity of the school as well as uh, walkable distance for, for the students. Uh, so Jeff, I know you had some significant, in, significant input on the last thing. Uh, did you want to uh, want to review that? Yeah, no, I think that, that, that pretty much covers it. I think, as you said, we, we took into account some of the comments that people had um, in, in terms of the, the policy. Um, so I think right now it's, it's very clean and, and uh, straightforward and then as Dan mentioned uh, Martha wrote an FAQ which kind of uh, highlights some of the some of the details of how this uh, this whole thing works uh, Martha did you have any anything you wanted to add to this or no, no I think it's been discussed from the last meeting and this meeting um, I guess the thing I would say is one of the things I've been really thinking about and have been able to reach out and talk to some parents and even some local realtors is how much of a change this really represents. So I think you know our goal is really to bring clarity to a previous policy around flexible boundaries. And so I think this policy, Jeff, as you said, is, is cleaner, hopefully clearer. And then with the attachment of the FAQs also, we will put that up on our website. We're going to actually send out sort of through direct email to all of our families this um, so we you know move forward that um, share that share that with all of our families, and I think that will be valuable also. And I also intend to write a letter to local realtors, so just to right. again make sure that the communication is as clear as possible on this right. topic. So we still have the um, open question, I guess. Of we we sort of um, referred to this, discussed this last time, but we have not changed that this element, which is the class size policy. This is something that I guess we discussed last time is wanting to revisit. This is not sort of part of this particular change that we've made, uh, but is that something that we still want to talk about in a future policy meeting, you know, coming back to that topic? Um, I definitely think it makes sense to, to come back to it at, at another time. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, you know, our primary focus has been on this policy. Right. So, right. Uh, but it does dovetail and it makes sense in, in a lot of ways how we're taking this policy and we're recognizing the realities on the ground. Right. Uh, in terms of you know, class size and, and distribution, or I'm sorry, in terms of, of school capacity, mm -hmm. uh, taking into account uh, class size as well as just something, the natural next step, as right. was mentioned by okay, yeah, the board last time. Okay. I agree. Uh, I agree too. Okay. Um, is there any further comment um, or questions about the um, policy that we are voting on tonight? Policy 730? No, no I don't have any questions. I do think. Um, I, I think it's really clean and very easy to understand, and I appreciate that. And I just want to like reiterate that it's really not changing anything we do. It's just actually bringing the policy up to what's going on. So it, this, while the policy looks very different, it's really reflective of the practice that's happening. It's so, a cleaner way to implement what mm. the flexible boundaries right, intended to do. That we are committed to, to neighborhood right. schools, Absolutely. and right. you know, um, it still holds everything that the other policy had. So. Right. We just note, sort of, this is not related to the policy directly, but it looks like from kindergarten enrollments for next year are already, uh, I can't remember the exact number, is 147. That's a very, very large it's number. Friday, so. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. Given at this point mm -hmm. right now, uh, it's already larger than the class entering class last year. We haven't even got the enrollments from people moving in over the summer, so uh, it's a little bit, um, a little bit of a concern right there mm -hmm. already. But, but um, we'll have to deal that with that as it comes, I guess. So, uh, so if there's no further discussion on this, then um, uh, Marjorie, please call the roll. Mr. Barsati. Aye. Mr. Hunt. Aye. Mr. Marhol. Aye. Ms. Murphy. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Motion carried. Um, thanks, Margie. And then uh, we have sort of uh, going along with the policy, which is very simple <coughs> and clean. We have the Exhibit 730E2, uh, which discusses a little more detail of um, how it's actually implemented um, and what the goals are, which as Linda mentioned last night, the goals are to maintain the neighborhood school, uh, to effectively use classroom space at the four elementary schools, 
and provide the administration with effective tool for maintaining appropriately balanced class size throughout the district. That's kind of what the goal is we're kind of trying to achieve here with this uh, with this uh, procedure. Um, and then it outlines a little bit about how things work exactly. So. Um, at this point, is there a motion to um, approve the exhibit 730E2 elementary school assignment policy? It's the exhibit to the policy as presented. So moved. Second. Does anyone have any um, questions or comments about this exhibit? If Aye. not, then um, Marjorie, please call the roll. Mr. Marvel? Aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion uh, carried. Thanks, Margie. Uh, next up is the Metro Chicago Mathematics Initiative um, contract for July 2018, July 2019. Uh, is there a motion for the Board of Education to approve the Chicago Metro Chicago Mathematics Initiative contract for July uh, 2018 to July 2019 as presented? So moved. Second. Um, Martha, would you maybe like to say a few words about this so that people know exactly what uh, sure. what's entailed here? So. Um, the Metropolitan Chicago Mathematics Initiative is actually a consortium of school districts in the area um, that have come together to really look at um, improving high quality math instruction, particularly with the shifts and changes that came with the Common Core State Standard. So um, in this particular agreement, what we've really purchased is really kind of what I would describe as kind of an a la carte coach, um, somebody that can come to us and work directly with our teachers on improving mathematics instruction in a way that yeah, actually Merrill works with the principals and with the teachers directly to kind of um, determine grade level and teachers that have been particularly interested in this. I know Merrill has some very preliminary data that we'll probably look at at our um, board goal setting date in the June COW meeting, um, but really we feel that it's been a really effective way for teachers to get some additional support. Professional development, we kind of talked about that job embedded professional development, that professional development really kind of delivered in real time to real teachers when they want to talk to us about real students. And this is one of those models for that that um, we find really exciting, but it's, um, it's a unique model and I think it deserves the board's unique attention with this particular consideration. Merrill, do you want to share more on that? Um, the only thing I wanted to add is it's not just benefiting the individual teachers that are working because they turn around and take the practices back to their team meetings as well. So the whole team has benefited um, from some of the feedback and the strategies that they've been working on. And like Ms. Martha said, there's some preliminary data that's looking exciting, and I don't want to go too far into it tonight, but you'll hear about it. Um, the people that were directly impacted, we saw some um, nice results on some of our current assessments that we're administering right now. So. So, but um, does anyone have any uh, questions about this or comments? If not, then Marjorie, please call the roll. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, next up is um, a motion, a uh, notice of a hearing of a resolution to waive limitation of administrative cost. Uh, so at this point, is there a motion for the Board of Education to approve the notice of hearing of resolution to waive a limitation of administration, administrative cost as presented? So moved. Second. Uh, Martha, would you maybe like to explain a little bit about what this is, what this is all about exactly? Right. So the State Board of Education really sets guidelines about um, the the allowable increase in administrative costs. So if you recall, we did that last year when the district hired full-time superintendent. Um, as you know, this year we hired a full-time director of finance. Um, so that, that number has incrementally gone up and changed over time, which requires us to have do this hearing process. Any questions about this topic and comments? If not, then uh, Marjorie, please hold the roll. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Hunt? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. Thanks, Margie. Um, so that's the end of the old business. We now move on to new business. We have the first item is capital and technology expenditures proposed for 2018-2019. Uh, we have two two sets of expenditures here. One are um, the capital expenditures, which I, um, and then the other is um, technology expenditures. I don't know if Mr. Holmes would like to maybe um, review these two kinds of expenditures for us here, listed here, to summarize them. Um, yes, as I outlined, 
their capital expenditures for the um, schools and special education totaled $82,722.64. And um, just to note that in the past, a lot of those would have been considered capital expenditures, but with the accounting codes, anything that is less than $500 is considered a supply account, and anything between 500 and 999 is a non-capital expenditure, and then anything $1,000 and above is, is a capital expenditure. And then um, for the for, um, technology, the um, their capital expenditures and supplies was $377,000. And then the software and licenses was $260,744 for a total of 637,744. And as I pointed out, um, a lot of those things that are considered technology are actually for other departments that the other departments are, they are charged to the other departments, but um, Don Tufano is managing those accounts. So it's not like his, account, his expenditures are going up, it's just that he's managing them for other departments. Are there any questions? Any questions? These items. I, I did have a question about the, uh, in, in particular, the, the classroom interactive projector replacement. I know we talked about some different options. I wasn't sure what we finally went with. I don't know, Don, if you had any information on that. I'm In, uh, in the presentation last month, mm -hmm. the recommendation was to move forward with uh, replacement at K-5. So at the elementary buildings uh, with the interactive projectors. I, I just didn't know, have we ever gone over what, what was the model we chose or what the capabilities were on that? I, I, know we, I remember it, at the tech steering committee, we've talked about a couple different things, but I didn't know if we finalized on something. Yeah, with given the way the, uh, with the current technology in there, there is some proprietary equipment relative to Epson, so we did stick with, with Epson. Mm -hmm. uh, Epson uh, does have a, uh, a couple of models of, of interactives. Um, it's not the premium model of interactive, uh, but it would be the equivalent replacement to what's in there, except it's the newer technology. Mm -hmm. So the, the technology that is, that is in classrooms now is in the five to six year old range, and five to six years ago is when the interactive projectors were really first coming, uh, on, uh, coming to market. Mm -hmm. So it was a very new uh, technology. Uh, and so this, uh, the, the, inter the interactive projectors that we're recommending for uh, with replacement are just m more current technology. Mm -hmm. So there's still projectors though, but they're not like flat screens or, or touch panels Correct. like that? Correct. It is still a, uh, a short throw projector, mm -hmm. very similar to the one that's mounted in the back of the, uh, the library here. What's the price difference between the interactive projector and just the standard projector? The, the, the diff price difference between is about 32%. Okay, so if you look at that overall dollar amount, the impact on that dollar amount is about 17.5% overall, or I believe about $26,000, difference okay. between a standard and an okay. interactive. And I think you said you said some surveys where you show you sort of said that, that, that there, for the elementary school teachers, they said that this interactive technology was absolutely essential. They couldn't live without it. Was that your kind of the that, Yes. And, and we, well, we, we, we framed it in terms of if, if it was functioning properly, I think some of the issues that they've had with the projectors that are, uh, are in currently is that it was a new technology. Um, so I think any time you become an early adopter of a technology, um, so what we did in advance of that, in advance of making a selection, we did deploy some new ones and had teachers working with it. And it's been you know, a world of difference to them in terms of the feedback that we got. But the, the feedback from the survey was that if it did function as, it was, as it's supposed to, that yes, they, 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 they really saw it as a tool that they would, they would use. And, and moreover, that students would use. Because I think that's the key is to really not necessarily have the student, the teachers using it all the time. It's that the students are at the front of the class also <coughs> using the interactivity. Because it's interesting, I, I, I ran a very small survey of my own uh, after we talked the last time, a sam sample of two, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, last name. The, the one, well, one report was that um, the one who's in ninth grade now said, well, we tried to use the interactive elements a few times, but it never really worked properly. And then the fifth grader said, she had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah. So like. <laughs> 
it was sort of slightly at variance with the idea that this is sort of like essential element. I mean, essential element to what they're doing currently. But you're suggesting that maybe they're going to use it more if they get something that actually works. Is that the idea? It, it, exactly. And I, yeah. I think a lot of the resources that have been, a lot of the curricular resources, especially at the primary grades, are, are really been designed for that mm -hmm. that interactivity. Okay. Uh, so it was. Uh, it also uh, allows them to, to leverage the, the resources more effectively. Yes. Sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go on. As we go to junior high, is it the same? Le is the same level of interactivity assumed with the resources, or no? And that's one of the reasons why we really put off the the uh, uh, the, the junior high purchase was really to, to, to dig a little bit deeper. The um, the feedback from staff was was very much mixed instead of it being very much swayed at the k5 where where um, there, there was a high level of desire to have that the interactive technology it was very split at the junior high um, so is it is it necessarily a blanket you know across the board we did notice that, like in encore classes it, it, it ranked high, highly as, as far as a need um, but in some of the more of the gen ed type classes it, it was not so what we're going to do is over the next year is just dig deeper and, and really identify well we want to put the the right resources in the right applications for some of the right and classrooms that would have been my suggestion e exactly well, so. so we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit deep, uh, deeper dive and gather more information for uh, I, I think one of the, the the features that the junior high really wanted was the untethered uh, the ability to be untethered to the projector currently um, uh, you do have to be connected via an HDMI or, uh, or VGA cable. With the technology that we're putting in at the uh, at, at K5, that will be uh, uh, you will have untethered. They will have untethered access to it as well. Can they still do untethered without interactive? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. So on the on the budget, it, you you listed as an exceptional expenditure, but in fact. <clears throat> Well, it's this is something that we don't, that, that it's not something that's recurring every single year. It's not every single year, but every, every five exactly. years you're going to Ex pay exactly. another right. so $100,000 or something like that. Obviously. Exactly. So if we go in this cycle, mm -hmm. the thing would be in, in probably, I think we could get five to six years out, mm -hmm. out of these, mm -hmm. these devices, and then we'd be in that cycle of doing K-5 and then doing the, the, the junior high the subsequent year. Um, one thing that we will do with the devices that we're pulling out, because we are doing projectors and document cameras, uh, is that we also have our own reserve of spares for the junior high for next year in case of failure. So we won't have to buy any replacement equipment uh, over the course of that year. And then we'll obviously have some spares in the, the, the future. And you said that last time, which I applaud. Uh, one minor nit to pick on the budget. Mm -hmm. um, can you, in terms of the quantities on these items, the Chromebooks, it's listed as one, and I'm sure it's, it's multiple machines. Right, it's so about, about we 200, we have the average okay. about 200 units per, per grade level. It, it depends on the, uh, the, the class size. That's what we really go by, projected class size, add some buffer, especially at the sixth grade, where we tend to pick up enrollments uh, you know, at, in sixth grade, I think how the enrollment numbers tend to, to j spike, you know, from uh, fifth grade to sixth grade. I think we pick up more students sure. in this year, so we Just base it on that. Can you add the number of items that we're actually purchasing sure. to this Yeah, we budget. could report back with it once we actually make a purchase. Oh, certainly. okay. Yes. Or even yeah. just the assumption of how many units. Right. That, that I'm basing it off of 200 units. Per, uh, per grade level. That's kind of our, our, our average, and so just use it as a budgetary number and then we, we come back with it. And what's the assumption with regards to the projectors? Um, because a we lot. have replaced some of the equipment, it's about, it's on average about 67 units of projector, document camera, control box, all the components, but it's not exactly that because we have replaced them. So there is some new equipment out there. But plus or minus is fine. But that number there, actually, that number is, we did get, I think the, the budgetary amount for the project was 167.5, and that number reflects the bids that we got back. So that is, there is a breakdown more of how many projectors, how many document cameras, how many control boxes are included, and installation. I'm not questioning the totals, just how many units are we talking about when that would be appreciated. Sure. Um, 
So uh, Ms. Kleiber couldn't be here tonight, but she just had a couple of questions that she wanted me to ask. One of them is, um, there's a, in the <coughs> software, there's a, an inline mathematics service for 27,000. What is that exactly? That is actually, um, that is currently 10 marks. Oh, 10 That's marks. a 10 marks program. Okay. And a as we discussed at the last meeting, the 10 marks is uh, going away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we will be looking at, I guess we will be looking at some alternatives to that. So, so but that is for the renewal for, for 10 marks. For 10 marks. Got it. Okay. Yeah, well, that is oh, for 10, there'll be one more year. Got it. Yes. But if we do find something, okay. uh, there has been some flexibility, or they're supposed to give us some flexibility or an out in our current contract. Okay. If we do identify something that we want to transition to mid-year, okay. we can do so. Okay. And then um, in terms of the software again, um, there's a bunch of different software programs. Um, she wanted to know which of these uh, different programs are new this year and which of them are recurring. Do you have the... Uh, the they were marked as, anything that was new was marked, new or expanded yep. was marked. I do believe, I don't have them in front of me. Do you have? Is this is the software in here? Yeah, it's all software. You have NGSS software, Steam expansion, a 3.5. Um, yeah, so that was the, the expanded, um, I think, for, yeah, the defined, defined STEM. Maybe uh, rather than you going through it right now, maybe could you just sure. like, uh, let, let uh, Martha know and then she can yeah, the, the board? Or? Th there were not, uh, I think there was, uh, you know, from an expand, oh, uh, I know one of the ones that w would be new would be the online fee payment. Okay. That was another one mm -hmm. that was a new service, but it was very, very limited in terms of the. So these are mostly renewals. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other um, questions then, for either uh, Mr. Tufano or Mr. Holmes? I, I just I'll go back to one comment where you said you kind of did some piloting programs of different options that were available for the. And this was about the projectors <coughs> again. Mm -hmm. So and and I also heard it said that. We chose the absence to keep some of the same connections and save costs there, I guess. Right. Yeah, there's, for instance, the, the mounting bracket mm -hmm. is a, a proprietary, it's not a universal mount. Okay. So it'd be another thing to uninstall, another thing to purchase, another thing to reinstall. Um, and then also finding, even finding a solution that has a, a level of a control box that mm -hmm. teachers have become very accustomed to everything that they connect into. It provides, uh, essentially, it's how you uh, toggle between different inputs. It, it inter interfaces with the audio system. So it's, yeah, it was kind of a, it, it, did, it did limit our, our search without really expanding the number of do the dollars on it. And then other options that were piloted, maybe were going to be significantly more costly or? The other ones that we did look at that mm -hmm. would have some type of a, a control interface. Mm -hmm. A lot of those were typically more, um, uh, more, more of a, a digital interface and, and, and uh, customizable, uh, which were very nice, but again, very mm -hmm. cost prohibitive. And then you also add on a layer of it's another thing to train on. It's another, you know, it's another level of cost, and even just to to get teachers up to speed to how to, with how to use that new interface. Mm -hmm. So there, from a um, you know from a transition standpoint, the, the, it also made a lot of sense. Uh, sticking with this. So the goal would be that we'd bring the same information back. We can make some of those additional um, sort of edits around quantity and then also sure. just making sure we're clear on which tools are new and which ones are continuation in the curriculum and as well as the operations area. Um, with the idea being that we would hope to be able to move forward because these are items that will be within next year's budget but require purchasing over the summer really before formal budget adoption. Okay. Any further mm -hmm. questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Um, next, we have a asbestos abatement proposal for 92 uh, Repton. I don't know, Mr. Holmes, who wanted to tell us about that. Uh. <coughs> for the um, demolition of the Repton house, the architects aren't experts in um, in asbestos abatement, so that this company would do the design work and the bid documents for that portion of, of the bid. So they, they'll they do the inspection to make sure that, because they did find um, asbestos in the, I believe the garage and some pipes, so they're gonna, so that's for that, for the 
inspection and the routing and the pipe and, and then the project design and document preparation, abatement contractors for the pre-bid and the walkthrough, and then the bid tabulation for when the bids come in. So they found some asbestos in like pipe insulation in the garage, is that? Yeah, in the, I believe it, the garage has it and then also um, in the house. Okay. Remind us, um, was this included in the previous estimates? I, I think it was in the demolition yeah. estimate, yeah, but it wasn't included in the professional service. Yeah, it's not, um, DLT or DLA will not make, will not be paid for this portion. No, I understood that, yes. but that was never, there was no line item for professional services for asbestos removal in the previous estimates we saw for the demolition. Is that, and you might not remember. Um, I don't believe it was, but. I didn't think so either, mm -hmm. but I don't remember uh -huh. either. But at least the design work it wasn't, but it. So this, but this is just for sort of identifying where the asbestos has to come out and right not and doing in the work, right? It's like three thousand hours. That just is to correct. Say, got to right. these pipes out or whatever. Right. So, yeah. Professional services for that. And it doesn't really require board action. It's more board information right. and knowledge mm -hmm. because it yes. also shift our timeline. Mm -hmm. to I say I don't know anything about asbestos removal, but. It's three thousand dollars to say you need to take this asbestos. It sounds like a lot. <laughs> it's like you don't know you to do the work, but like a so professional consultant to say, yeah, I get some asbestos here. You know, how much design do you you know? I think a professional consultant, asbestos firm, would know exactly what to do without having a three thousand dollar design. But I guess I just had a question too because um, this is a few years back, but I had asbestos removed from a condo building that I was the treasurer for, and we contracted out. But they took the asbestos out. We didn't hire somebody to walk through and say, you got to take this out. Right. I think it would be fairly straightforward. I right. Think. They so took it out. And, I mean, it was more than $3,100. I'll let you know that. It work. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. This right. isn't even work. <coughs> right. Well, the district has to publicly bid mm -hmm. the work. And right. in order to get proper bids, you have to have the, des the design and right. what is entailed properly so that there are, so that they can, every bidder can make the same mm -hmm. bid. Right. So that, and then less unforeseen conditions and things like that. So that's kind of why this is needed. Right. Whereas um, DLA is not an expert at this, so they are saying that this company should do it for them, for, or for the district. Okay. Any other questions about this topic? Thanks, Mr. Holmes. Mm -hmm. um, next, we move on to uh, item three, which is the evidence-based funding model. Uh, Martha, yes. did you want to? Yes, I'll take that one. Um, so we, I know the board has been informed of this really over the course of this particular year, um, but really wanted to take a few minutes to inform the board and ask, provide an opportunity to ask questions, but also really inform the community about evidence-based funding. So I'm going to move through this relatively quickly, I think. Let's see. Um, so evidence-based funding is sort of the new law of the land around funding for school districts. My understanding is really this has um, funding for Illinois school districts really has not changed since 1997. Um, so evidence-based funding really speaks to this idea of adequacy of funding. So there's a new state formula to really establish adequacy funding for school districts. I think it's really important, uh, particularly in District 96 and a lot of other districts is when we talk about our adequacy target. Um, but there's not a mandate or an edict in this. This is really a concept. It's really a theoretical model for funding school districts. So um, really comes to this interesting question of what is adequacy um, and a group of researchers in the state board and the state of Illinois um, tried to look at some particular research around that and we'll, we'll talk about that um, here as we move forward. But the important thing I think is we think about um, evidence-based funding in District 96 and something I know I think a lot about and our district leadership team has thought a lot about and talked a lot about is considerations of uh, where we align and where we don't. Um, and really this opportunity to tell our District 96 story and to make sure that that's a story that's consistent um, for all of you as board members and as something that is really understood by our community. So um, I will try not to get too technical. I actually attach for the board and in the board book for public view if people are interested. Um, much more detailed and elaborate presentations done by the State Board of Education on this topic. And you can really dig in and study it as much as you want. But what I really want to get to is kind of that big idea around District 96 and um, and what we have right now. So um, the, the stages in determining adequacy, we're really looking at the cost of educating all students according to these defined 
you know, cost factors, then looking at each district's local resources. Um, our local resources are specifically our property tax dollars. Um, and then looking at a process of distributing additional state funds to assist districts in meeting adequacy. So again, thinking about the really the purpose behind a lot of the state funding was to bring districts up to an adequacy level um, so that all districts had kind of that some some base what they really are looking at that base funding minimum um, and then applying new money to districts that um, would need more than the base so as we move forward um, understanding that there are 26 elements I think it was 27 and went back to 26 I think it's 26 um, elements that went into a determination of what goes into evidence-based funding um, so it was things like class size things like class size different for children and communities of high poverty um, the kinds of supports and services that we use to intervene and support students so how many specialists um, something like a math interventionist or a reading specialist but also how many special area teachers like music and art um, that we have and and very much value in our community. Also looking at things like principals. They talk about principals and assistant principals in a prototypical school size. Um, one of the things we also know is we are not prototypical in terms of our school sizes. Um, but other ideas like instructional facilitators. So you heard us talk just briefly about our a la carte purchasing of a coach from the MCMI group. So instructional facilitators are kind of that viewed as that um, that coach, that person, that guide on the side, that person that comes in kind of a master level teacher that does that job embedded professional development. And then school site support. School site supports really speak about the things that you just need operationally to run a school, like a school secretary um, is one of the areas that comes up. So all those things went into this formula and looking at those 26 different elements. Um, and then it was calculated with our student enrollment. And then they looked at our actual revenue. So what do we really acquire in terms of property tax? And then they established this distribution or tier distribution for new money. Um, you can look at sort of, again, a, a different way of kind of looking at a sum of all those educational costs. And what I really, and again, I think I described a lot of these, but again, those areas of um, what they look at as effective or evidence-based resources. So we talk about as kind of a theoretical model or a, a model of how to distribute resources. Um, and so again, some of them are named and listed there. And you all have um, even a more detailed analysis available to you in board book and sort of our own measurements within District 96 and sort of where we have some of this, enough of this, not enough of that. Again, according to that model with again the more important question being of what's most important here in District 96. So this to me is the key question of what does this really all mean for District 96. Um, really important and valued conversations again within the district and around where we align and where we don't. Um, but really we've also talked a lot about taking kind of this holistic overview of all of our resources. So, um, so an example where we're higher is paraprofessionals, but an area where we're lower is what they call supervisory aids. So aids that would help perhaps with uh, entry into school in the morning and lunch supervision. We're very low on that, but we're, we're high on the paraprofessional end. When you look at it in combination, um, we start to sort of match up a little better. English language learners was an area that we um, knew we were um, probably somewhat deficient in several years ago. That's a program um, that there's been a lot of increased in supports and services and also a lot of really important gains. Um, one of the things you may not have been super noticeable in the personnel report tonight is we're actually going down a 0.5 FTE um, in the supports for English language learners. Because so many children with the right supports that were put in place, moved out of the program. So again, that that to me really speaks to that what is our District 96 story because we needed that service, we still need that service, um, but maybe now not to as much of a um, degree or need as much as we sort of put the right services in place. When we look at the work around gifted and advanced learners, and you all heard um, a report on that just a, two months ago, um, they talk about a certain dollar amount for gifted learners, but we really define that more broadly around sort of advanced learners, very intentionally and by design uh, when we thought about the kinds of supports that we wanted to deliver to students in District 96. So again, when we try to look at it holistically, um, I think there's a better match. When we kind of dig in and look at the where we have too much or where we have too little, I'm not always sure that that, that explains exactly what it is we're trying to do to make sure that all of our children are successful here in our school district. So um, again, it's that careful consideration I put here is of our effectiveness, what works and what do our students need. And that has been, I know, something that um, was well in the works before I got here as the superintendent, but as the superintendent that is very much an ongoing conversation that we have weekly, if not daily, with our district leadership team and our principals. Um, 
around what works and what do students need. And um, again, I sort of put at the bottom there, scrutiny, uh, scrutiny of our new and existing resources. So how do we know um, that the services that this board has really very generously applied to our school district are really working and are really making a difference in the lives of our children? And I look at tonight when, what, 60 some odd children came and um, really they were being awarded and acknowledged for many of those special things that we do in this district that other districts might not be able to offer some of those programs and services for children. So again, it's part of what we value and um, part of what we also then pay for and what it also then makes us look our adequacy target is higher as you'll see here as we move forward. So this idea of needing to be flexible in the application of our resources, we have, um, as you know, two very small elementary schools. We just talked about our student assignment policy just a few minutes ago about really valuing the neighborhood school concept. Um, by doing that, we really acknowledge that we don't have prototypical school sizes, um, but that in doing that, we also have supported those schools with a principal and a school secretary and a nurse and you know things that we really feel are important to make sure that there's a high quality education happening in all five of our schools. And I think that's very much something that this district has delivered well on. So again, this is, um, it gets a little bit um, interesting, perhaps complicated. We are determined to be at this tier four of adequacy, which means that we are above the adequacy target of 110%, meaning that we have essentially what some people have described as an over distribution of resources. Um, again, it goes back to that question of, is the evidence-based funding a minimal model? And as a district like ours, we want to be above the minimum. On the other hand, we want to continue to be incredibly thoughtful to our taxpayers. And so making sure that, again, this is a high-quality education that is well-resourced but is a good value for for the community. And I think we know that families move to this community for the school districts and the services um, that children receive in the schools. So. Um, so we um, are at 127% of adequacy when 110% is the target. I think early in the year they were initially estimating us to be somewhere around 131. Um, when they did have more careful calculation of our student enrollment tax dollars, we actually dropped down just a little bit to 127% of adequacy, which actually means that um, our new money coming from the state, new money, um, is $2,376. So you see that that's a really minimal amount. Um, and so that, that general state aid or that general state contribution of money is listed there um, for fiscal year 18. Is that and the total amount <coughs> from the state? That that's, the, that's the total amount. Extra, so that's quite a drop extra. from that's a, The additional new money is the 2,376. Yeah. I'm looking for Rob. Where did Rob go? Did he? Okay. That's this fiscal year. Yeah, that's fiscal year 18, which is this yes. year. So that's our hold harmless. Amount. S the hold harmless, Martha, if you could. Sorry, Martha and Rob. The hold harmless is. You want to come up, Rob? Sorry. The hold harmless, under my understanding, is that whatever state funding we are currently getting, we will continue. We will continue to get, and so that two thousand dollars is the additional funding that the state is providing statewide, and that's our portion of it. Yes. Yes, since they're uh, tier four. Based on all factors, that yes, uh, old harmless would have been one thousand four. That would have been the one point four million. We get the additional two thousand three hundred seventy six. So a couple things happened. One is the promise was that there was this hold harmless amount mm -hmm. that the school districts would not receive less money, um, but they also recalculated. How, what goes into this general state aid number. So um, in particular, like some of the EL grants, some of the grants for English language learners were converted into the state monies. Um, PAM, some special education reimbursement around personnel were then converted into the state money. So it is a hold harmless amount. I think we're still wondering, is it, you know, is it less money? <laughs> You know, because is I, thought it we were, I thought we were getting more than 1.4, 1.5 million. I thought we were getting only like 2 million from the state. That's well, on the recent. You, there's other state monies. There's other state. This right. is not everything. Yeah, this, there's like other categoricals that are still not, that in are play. Not here. Got yeah. it. But that, this is just the um, general state aid plus some of the, um, there's an, some small EL amounts. Transportation. Um, some. Transportation is separate. Was, was it yeah. um, facility? Yeah, transportation is separate. Um, some special ed. Right, some of this, there, there was some conversion of some previous reimbursements that will right. now be rolled into. That's rolled into there so that it's all based on that. So I think people are still feeling cautious and in kind of a wait and see mode. You know, um, 
we are not a district that has to sort of wait for the state to um, provide the funding for us to be able to really keep our doors open. Um, I think we're appreciative of that, very appreciative of that. Um, but we want to certainly monitor that we are truly at that hold harmless amount that we are getting the, the state monies. Um, so, you know, really, in, in summary, it's, you know, our goal, as we know, is to provide a high quality education that addresses the needs of all students. That is the work of public education every single day. That is indeed a challenge. It's a challenge for all of you as board members, for district leadership, for our teachers. Um, but I think our families certainly acknowledge that um, those investments matter. Um, those investments are really important that I think our goal is obviously and our um, commitment is to continue to really monitor um, and to continue to bring back, you know, the both what's working, you know, is it working, um, and really scrutinizing and when and where we can make shifts and changes and continue to be very effective. That's, that's our ongoing, you know, that's our ongoing goal. So I think this, this, uh, this evidence-based funding brings it all into focus a bit. It really, I think, has um, been cause for some really valuable conversations amongst, I know even with um, all of you as board members, our district leadership team, and continuing to look, look carefully at all of this. So um, that is, that is evidence-based funding in the <coughs> nutshell, and I wanted to make sure that you had all that. Um, our state report card and how um, information will be shared about each local school, sort of the student achievement, the cost attributed to each local school. That's all in a sort of shift and changing. There's a changing landscape there right now too. So we also think some of this will be uh, more illuminated for the entire community through the state report card process. Any questions? All right. Anyone questions? I did have one question I think where you talked about the 26 points and you know mm -hmm. it, so it sounds like we have an idea coming back from the state how we compare where we're yes beneficial where we're not uh, or are in line with their recommendations right. I guess right. and I'm not sure how much how important that is given our level of funding uh, I just wondered yeah. you know what what those might be or were there areas and would that be something that we might want to target for improvement in the years ahead or yeah. is that really much of a consideration for us no I think it's very much a, con <coughs> a real consideration actually you have it in the board pack so it's public information for all um, really it's what we call a gap analysis here it's mm -hmm. called the worksheet um, Marilyn and I actually attended a workshop back in January where we kind of really moved through very specific formulas we took our personnel list we matched it to these supports and services um, and as you see on that worksheet that's attached uh, things that are in red are where we don't have enough of um, per the evidence-based funding and things in the white are where we have too much of and what you find it's interesting is um, we fall into both categories so it's not like from an evidence-based funding and being at a high adequacy we have sort of too much of or over distribution of resources in core areas so it's um it's an interesting model and i think that's th that is the question is it a model we want to align to you know because uh, one of the conversations with school district leaders is it you know they talked about sort of a timeline of probably about 10 years if you really as a goal want to align to this model, which for us would mean some increases in some areas and some decreases in others. And I think to continue to look at this as a as a resource, as a framework, I think there really is value in it. I don't mean to say to ignore it. It's just I think we continue to look to determine where we fit, where we don't. Where we don't, why not? And is that why not a good reason that's really benefiting children? But even if we were to more closely align, it's not like it's going to improve our allocation all that much. Our, if we align, if we perfectly aligned, we would drop inadequacy, mm -hmm. and we would then, in theory, perhaps not levy as much in tax. You know, like would there be some sort of a lessening of the tax burden if we truly aligned? I think that's that's a complicated question, but I think that theoretically, there's that's mm -hmm. part of the answer. Like what you said, Martha, but I, I guess my, my concern, I, I think we should try to align to this, but I think we need to look at, as you mentioned, what our schools are and why are we not meeting it, why might we need more staff? Because, I mean, I think this is, I mean, each school is unique throughout the state. And, I mean, we're unique, we're different than other schools. And so I think we should, our goal should be to align, but I think we should keep the alignment in, sort of in, in light of what's going on in our, in our district. 
one one that's, that's interesting that jumps out here, right, is that um, they talk about one principal for every prototypical school of 450 students at the elementary level. So we don't have a school of 450 students. We have one that's close to 400, and then we have two that, as you know, are just over 100. Um, so, but interestingly, we come up as over one and a half principal. But it doesn't mean that we want to get rid of one and a half principals. Um, but then it talks about schools should have assistant principals, and it talks about it that we're under by two and a half assistant right. principals. So it's a very, you know, so is that, you know, almost almost a wash, you know. So um, it's. It's a model, it's a theoretical model, it's a resource, it's a model for distribution of resources, and it's not something we're ignoring, but I, you know, I appreciate the comments. I think that's consistent with you know, the um, district administrators, too, is thinking, like, if we just did this, we would either be undoing some programming and leaving some other things um, that are necessary and needed, you know, un unmet needs, and, th and that's not what we want to fall into, certainly. Anything else? Mm -hmm. We have one other thing. Right, Jeff, one other item? So we, um, any other comments on this topic? And if not, then the uh, next item is the proposed facilities improvements for this uh, summer of 2018. Um, I don't know if Mr. Holmes would like to um, review these for us quickly. Just basically a in list of to the Repton demolition of Repton and the Blythe Park roof replacement, these, uh, I gave um, $160,500 worth of um, projects that the Director of Buildings and Grounds thinks that, and I think, can be done in-house. Does anyone have any questions or comments about these uh, projects, these small projects for the uh, different schools? When you say in-house, you mean just done through our usual methods? Yeah. Um, go out, get some quotes. They're within the, oh. the threshold and hire someone to do it or okay. have, you know, some of the guys do it. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Understood. Any other questions on these topics? No. These are all basic maintenance items that should... Sounds good. Th uh, thanks, Mr. Holmes. All right. Thank you. Um, so then, uh, I think that wraps the things up. Uh, future meeting dates are June 6th, uh, meet the hold, 7 p.m. at Hauser. Uh, June 20th, regular business meeting, 7 p.m. at Hauser. Um, July 4th, meet the hold meeting is canceled. And, um, Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think if there's there's a bunch of closed session items at the back, the bottom of the agenda, but I think that's a mistake. So. Um, there's no other business, then let's adjourn.